So my part to introduce Frank and um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce Frank and to welcome him back to Heidelberg after I think five years or so. Frank did his PhD in Leiden. Two people, at least people in Heidelberg, also know very well. It's Tim Seo and Wolf Chappie on um, dynamics of elliptical galaxies. Um, it was very, a very successful project. So Frank had a fellow in Seattle after his PhD. And from Seattle, he came back to Europe, first to the MPA, <coughs> not the MPIA, uh, uh, in, in, in Munich. Moved then in 2003, turned on to Zurich. Yeah, ETH, I call it. Uh, stayed there uh, in the group of time living for a while before he decided that uh, I felt it was at least more friendly. <laughs> 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 so he came to our institute, stayed here from 2005 to early 2009, uh, when he then first moved to Utah, and um, since two years ago, yeah, two years ago, he's professor in Yale University, and you see what he will tell you about. Please. Thank you. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be back, to see so many familiar faces. Um, and to see such a wonderful building and nice weather. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about some work we've done in the last couple of years on trying to glue together basically something that we have learned over the last 10 years regarding halo occupation statistics. And we sort of want to stitch this together now at different redshifts to so see where we can sort of build a coherent picture about how galaxies build up their stellar mass. This is work that I've done in collaboration with these people down here. Okay, these two people highlighted the ones that did most of the work. So, the outline is I'm going to start by saying a few things about halo occupation statistics. It will be very brief. Okay, basically the upshot is we have learned a lot there. Then I'm going to say something about semi-analytical models for galaxy formation. Okay, and basically the upshot there is we still have many problems. And then I'm going to move to another modeling technique, okay, which is what I call empirical modeling. It's basically data-driven rather than physics-driven. And I'll give you two examples of such models, and I'll talk about what we can learn from that. The first is a self-consistent dynamic model. Okay, it sounds funky, it doesn't mean much. The other one is very similar to some other modeling. It's sort of a forward modeling where you propagate some recipes through emergent trees for dark matter mass assembly. And we'll see what we learn from that. So here, occupation modeling. Um, the idea there is basically that you want to build a statistical link between galaxies and dark matter halos. Okay? Dark matter is what dominates the universe. We, we know from our simulations how much halos there are, okay, what they look like, and we want to link them to the galaxies, which are the things that we actually see. Okay, and one thing you can do is you can characterize that galaxy dark matter connection with what we call the conditional stellar mass function, which is a statistic that describes, given a halo of this mass, how many galaxies of stellar mass MS does such a halo host on average? Okay, it's a purely statistical thing. The reason why we're interested in getting constraints on that is because of two things. One is you can do cosmology with it. And the idea is very simple. If I, in a statistical sense, know how much dark matter is associated with each galaxy, I can take the distribution of galaxies in Sloan and turn it into a distribution of matter. And that, of course, is very strongly cosmology dependent. Okay? And recently we wrote a whole bunch of papers on doing cosmology along those lines. We were very excited, we got results, and we were very tight, we were in good agreement with WMAP, and I was thinking, ah, oh, I'm going to talk about that here, and I'm blanking now, and basically the agreement is not so good anymore, so until I figured out what's on, I'm going to talk about the other application of galaxy dark matter connection, and that's the physics of galaxy formation. And again, the idea is simple, okay? We think that 
the dark matter mass of a halo sets a lot of properties, uh, determines basically the efficiency of many physical processes. You think of feedback, okay? feedback is more efficient in less massive halos. You think of dynamical friction, you think of all these things, all those things have scalings with dark matter halo mass. So if we first can determine what kind of galaxy lives and what kind of halo, we can reverse engineer and figure out how do these processes have to operate. So over the years, different people have used different methods to constrain these halo occupation statistics. And I should point out that this game started basically around 2000-2003. So it's, it's only about 10 years old, but we have made huge progress. Okay. Probably the most direct way to probe the galaxy dark matter connections via galaxy group catalogs. Okay. The idea is very simple. You try to group those galaxies together that you believe live in the same dark matter halo. And then you assign to that group of galaxies some way, you assign it the halo mass, and you now, for each individual galaxy, have a measure of its associated halo mass. So you can directly study galaxy formation and properties in that way. A more statistical method is galaxy clustering. And the idea, again, is very simple. We know from hierarchical structure formation, more massive halos are more strongly clustered. So if you have two populations of galaxies, and one of them is more strongly clustered than the other, well, it has, on average, even more massive halos. And that's basically the, uh, the whole idea behind it. So you can use the clustering of galaxies to figure out this link between galaxies and dark matter halos. Another technique is satellite kinematics. Okay, the idea, you use satellite galaxies, and you measure their velocity dispersion, how fast they're moving around, around the central galaxy. That's a measure for the mass of the halo in which those galaxies are moving. And Suvik Mora, who was my student here at MPIA, did a thesis on that. My other student, Marcello Cacciato, who is here, worked at the same time on the other technique, which is galaxy, galaxy lensing. The idea there is that basically each galaxy has a dark matter halo around it, and that can distort background galaxies by gravitational lensing. And it results in a little shear distortion, tangential shear distortion of background galaxies, which you can measure. It's a very, very difficult measurement. You can only measure it in a statistical sense by stacking many, many galaxies, okay, which makes the interpretation very difficult. But again, it is just another way of probing what is the average amount of dark matter mass associated with a certain galaxy. And then finally, this is another method that has become very, very popular because it's very, very utterly simple. It's stupidly simple, but it works amazingly well. And that's called subhalo abundance matching. What you do there is you basically take your volume of the universe, you rank order all the galaxies according to stellar mass. Then you go to numerical simulation, the same volume. You pick out the dark matter halos and you rank order all the halos by mass. Subtle sort of thing is that you look now at subhalos, and for the subhalo you don't register the mass that that subhalo has today, but you register the mass that it had at info. You rank order all those halos according to those masses and you match the rank order. Ansatz okay. really is most massive galaxy gives you the most massive halos. Second massive galaxy? Second. It couldn't be simpler than that. You assume that, you do that in the numerical simulation, you put the galaxies in according to that ridiculously simple recipe, you reproduce the clustering observed. You reproduce the satellite kinematics. You reproduce all these results, okay, that cost two us 10 years to figure out. Okay. It's amazing. And it basically means that we're now at a stage where you can make plots like this. This is made by Peter Berluzzi, student from Risa Wexler. He basically went through the literature in the last 10 years and looked at all these different curves of people that have measured different ways of measuring the galaxy dark matter connection. This is probably as the stellar mass of a galaxy divided by the mass of the host halo in which it lives, function of halo mass. And they're all different methods, different, different groups, different uh, data sets, and they all agree remarkably well. Okay, this is called progress. 10 years ago, we had no clue what this book looked like. And now we have very good constraints. And they all agree with each other, and that's fantastic. So that deserves, okay, but, but there's also something you can immediately learn from that. Okay? It's interesting to look at this maximum, right? It has a maximum of around 10 to the 12 solar masses. And a maximum here means that a halo of 10 to the 12 solar masses is the most efficient at turning gas into stars. Okay? Must be something from characteristic scale and galaxy formation that sets that. How efficient is it? Well, it's ridiculously inefficient. So if you look at that ratio, it basically says that the stellar mass to halo mass ratio is about 0.03. You take into account that the universal barium fraction is about 18%. That means that even in this maximum, only about 20% of the bariums have turned into stars. Which, by the way, is roughly the mass of a Milky. 
At a more mass event, and at a less mass event, it dies down. Galaxy formation becomes less and less and fish in and fishing. And, and the holy grail of galaxy formation is to figure out why does this plot look like that, okay? And the answer that you get from the community, okay, is, oh, there's the feedback, oh, that's supernova feedback. And energetically, there's no problem, right? There's certainly enough energy to do it. But the real problem is how do you couple that energy? How do you thermalize it? How do you actually make it work? I mean, and that's still very much unsolved. Um, so the take home message one, so we hold this to those things. Okay. Due to the great advances in data, we now have a very robust statistical description of the galaxy that has a connection. Okay? And now the question is what does it tell us about galaxy information? What can we learn from this? Now, before I do that, I want to step step aside and look at some analytical model, okay, which is one of the most often used techniques to investigate galaxy formation. My definition of a analytical model, it's, it's a phenomenological model that uses approximate analytical descriptions to describe the various processes relevant to galaxy formation in order to make descriptions that can be compared to observations. Note my word of phenomenological rather than physical. Okay, that's where I differ from so much. The idea is, is very simple. Okay? You get some assumptions about your cosmology these days. That's hardly an assumption anymore. And for that cosmology, you can work out halo merger trees. Either by using a numerical simulation or doing the fresh Schechter theory. And then you put in a prescription that says, how does the gas cool in these dark matter halos? Okay? And then the idea is, well, that gas has a little bit of angular momentum from cosmological torques. Cooling is an isotropic process. The photons fly off in random directions. They don't carry off any angular momentum. So the gas cools conserves angular momentum, will spin up and form a disk. And then the disk, the gas density gets high enough that star formation ignites. So in you put a recipe for star formation, and in you put a recipe for feedback, and you can predict what the disk is going to look like. You run the three emerger tree, every now and then two halos merge. That means that you now have a dark matter halo that has two galaxies in that are orbiting around, and they will sink towards the center by dynamical friction. And when they reach each other, they merge. You can put in a description for how a massive merger can trigger a starburst. The merger is massive enough, it probably turns the disks into spheroids. These spheroids can have new gas cooling around them and form a disk around them. That's how you end up with those disk systems. And this entire prescription you run through your merger tree, and then you turn it into observables if you want. If you run some stellar creation models, chemical evolution, dust extinction. And you can make a population of galaxies and compare it to observation. And this is an entire industry. Here's sort of state-of-the-art stuff. This is from a recent paper by Rachel Somerville. It's one of the people who does these models. And don't read the table, just look at the length of it. Okay? We ought to see these are all the three parameters in her fiducia model. Okay? And it's 25. Okay? So people often say, oh, you only have three free parameters. No, no, they changed between three parameters in that particular paper, but they have 25 or 30 free parameters. So galaxy formation is very complex, you know, you have, have AJ-driven winds, radio mode feedback, black hole growth, supernova feedback, bursty star formation, quiescent star formation, oh, a bunch of free parameters, and you play around with it, and you run it through your merger tree, you gave the things merge, and so with 30 free parameters, come on guys, you should be able to get a fit, right? Well, no. <laughs> so this is state of the art, this is from a recent paper by the Munich group, okay, go at all, and what they're plotting is the stellar mass function. Stellar mass, abundance of galaxies, open symbols of data. So this model was tuned, as almost all similar models do, to reproduce the stellar mass from the of zero. That's basically what you do. Okay? And then you can see, okay, does this model now reproduce the stellar mass from the higher redshift? What you want to look at is the green line. The answer is no, it doesn't at all. You look here, it's dramatically over-predicting the abundance of low-mass galaxies. This is a logarithmic plot, right? This is effect of five, six. Not only does it get that wrong, it also gets the clustering wrong. This is a projected correlation function. Okay, just a measure of the two-point correlation function. The data points are from Sloan. We now can measure these correlation functions with exquisite precision. Okay, the error bars are smaller than the data points. Really, really tight measurements. The line that pictures from the model. Well, in my view, it's not very, it's not very bad. But again, the logarithmic plot, the clustering is up by a factor two or three. That's a huge deal, believe me. Plus, if you look at the actual chi-square of this fit, it's, it's ridiculous. It's terrible. Okay. So, galaxy formation is not only complex, it's also unsolved. We still don't have a model that works. Okay. Here's a very nice paper from Simone Weinman, Pasquale, and, and uh, Andrea Macho. 
Uh, let's go to the plot is abundance of galaxies in a particular stellar mass range, as a function of redshift. And this is the data point from various surveys. The black line is a model from Goa, though, similar little model. Okay, so as I said, it's, it's tuned to fit at the ratio of zero, but then at lower redshift, it starts to over predict it. All the other lines, hydrodynamical simulations. Same thing, they look very much the same. They vary the description for supernova feedback from no supernova feedback to momentum driven winds to energy driven winds to all sorts of whatever winds. And it always does the same thing, and it can't get it to work. Okay. So there are many unsolved problems, neither SAMs nor SIMs, in reproducing assembly histories of low mass halos. So, despite a huge number of free parameters and 25 years of hard work by many different people, we still can't fit even the most basic observables of the galaxy distribution, which is the abundance as function of friendship. So what do you do in a case like that? Well, all the students will tell you, you go to Google. Okay? You Google, you Google. Help me, what does galaxy evolution look like? This is what it tells you. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, Google is not much of a help here. So what we do instead is we go back to the drawing board. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to ask a very simple question. Can I construct überhaupt? Überhaupt is a German word? Yeah. Überhaupt, a self-consistent model for stellar mass assembly in galaxy dark matter halos that is consistent, one, with the data, and two, with our lambda CDM paradigm. Because it could be that we're trying to tune all these galaxy information parameters, but we just screwed up the cosmology. So that's the first step. And if we can, then what does it tell us about galaxy information? And what are we doing wrong in all these models? Okay. So if you want to test something like that, you need a model that's simple, transparent, and gives insight. Not a model with 33 parameters that are all coupled in feedback loops. So that's what we try to do. We try to build a really simple model that is driven by the data, Okay, I'm really trying to make it fit the data. And this is what we do. Step one, we use a conditional stellar mass function to model this thing. Okay? But we don't model in physics, we just model, we assume a functional form for this thing here. So it is a conditional stellar mass function, given a halo of this mass at that redshift, how many galaxies that mass does it have? Okay? And we're going to spin it in a central component and a satellite component. And the central is the guy that sits in the center of the halo, the satellite is the one that's zooming around. And will be useful, obviously, later on. <coughs> and we're going to constrain that using data, which is the stellar mass functions as a function of redshift, it's a measurement. And the theory basically is just a dark matter paradigm that says, okay, I know how many halos I have of a given halo mass function of redshift. Okay? So those two things combined, in principle, I can constrain this and I have huge degeneracy. Okay? I'm just going to parameterize it to see whether I can do how to get a fit. That was the goal. Step two, I'm going to combine this, once I know what this thing is, I'm going to combine that with the mass assembly histories of dark matter halos to figure out the stellar mass assembly histories, right? So this thing comes from here. This here this says, given the halo mass of a given mass today, what was it mass at an earlier time? That's the mass assembly history of the halo. And again, again, get that from merger history, merger trees, and merger simulation. So that's also theory. And you combine these two things. And you basically can see how a central galaxy grows in mass as a function of time. Okay, it comes out. And then the second thing, the last thing you do is you just take the di time derivative of that, and that should be basically your star formation rate. Well, modulo two things, you have to correct for stellar evolution, because even if nothing happens, you don't form any stars, and nothing happens, the stellar mass of the system will go down because stars die. Okay, so you account for that. That's basically stellar evolution. Okay. Modular uncertainties in the IMF, we sort of know what that is. And you need to account for mass accretion, because a galaxy can grow in mass not only by forming stars, but also by eating up another galaxy. But that is something that is said by satellites. That is basically how many galaxies do I have available in my halo to eat up? So I have some constraints on that. Very simple idea. So, a little bit more technical. Okay. Uh, for the central galaxies, we assume a functional form for this conditional Nossi function that is log normal. This is motivated by what we see in the group catalog and what we have learned from halo capacity statistics. This is a realistic group <coughs> assumption. So that means that a given halo mass, I have a characteristic stellar mass for my galaxies that live in the halo and which are scatter around it. And those two things are going to be depending on halo mass and redshift, and I parameterize that by nine free parameters. 
Okay, we're not doing physics here, we're just asking, can I get a fit to the data at all? In the satellite galaxies, and here comes the self-consistent aspect of the model, you have to realize that a satellite galaxy is nothing but a central galaxy that has fallen in to become a satellite. So if I want to describe my satellite galaxies, I have to link it to the central galaxies at earlier times. Okay? It is related to the central conditional stellar mass function at ZA, which is the time of accretion in which that guy came in. Okay? Now basically, if you, if you realize that, that basically means you need to know, given a halo of a given mass and redshift, how many subhalos did that guy accrete at that time of accretion. That again, that's just dark matter halos, statistics, merger trees, we know that thing. This is a complicated looking thing that just describes, well, once a galaxy comes in, it has a certain stellar mass, but that's not necessarily the same as the stellar mass it has today. The satellite galaxy can also continue to grow in, in stellar mass, or it can be strict. So this contains all the physics, but what can happen to a satellite galaxy? Okay. Then I have to realize that, okay, that this may depend on the mass of the host halo in which it was accreted, which is not the same as the mass of the halo today. So then there's an evolution of the halo mass, which again, it's just, we know what it is. And finally, this may depend on the orbital properties. Okay. The stripping efficiency will be very different for a radio orbit than for a circuit orbit. So there's a, Dependence on the orbital circularity, eta. But again, this probability function we know from simulation. So this is known, this is known, this is known. This is basically part of the model. We just need a model for this thing. Well, the goal was simplicity, so let's be simple. Let's assume basically that what happens is that the stellar mass of a satellite galaxy is basically only given by the central mass at accretion. Okay? And the average central mass of central galaxies of the same halo mass, let me try to explain it in words. We introduce one free parameter, C, and if C is zero, okay, it basically means that I assume that once a central galaxy satellite becomes a satellite, its stellar mass is frozen at that point in time. Okay? It's a, as if I immediately quench star formation and the stripping doesn't happen. If I set C to one, then basically I assume that that satellite continues to grow in stellar mass as if it was a central galaxy. So the idea is there's no, no quenching at all. The truth probably lies somewhere in between, but in principle, I allow C to be negative or 20 or whatever the data wants. Okay. And now I'll, I'll worry about what it means. Okay. It's just, and then finally, a galaxy, satellite galaxy is also disrupted. It's disrupted after basically a dynamical friction time. Okay. And the dynamical friction time, well, Let's put an alpha in front of it that I can tune up and down so I can destroy my satellites the way I want. I can tune alpha extremely high, which basically means my satellites will never be disrupted. Like I said, alpha very low, which means my satellites basically come in and boom, are ripped to pieces. Okay? And I'll show you that with, even with those ridiculous models, I can get perfect fits. That's the goal. Here we go. So you run this thing through the machinery and ask, can I fit the data? And the data is shown as the circles, the symbols, the things with arrow bars on it. And the lines are things without air bars on it. And you're supposed to look at the red line. Actually, that's not one line, that's four different lines corresponding to four different models. And I'll explain you what they are in a minute. Look at what we get. We can fit the stellar mass function from redshift 0 to redshift 4, like piece of cake. Okay? I have like 10, 11 free parameters. It didn't take me more than half a day, full Bayesian analysis. I can get a fit. No problem. Really easy. I mean, there's a huge degeneracy, but there's only one model that works. No, there's a whole bunch of models. Look, fit zero, okay, which is the long dash line, you can't see it, but it's alpha zero. It basically means, as soon as they come in, satellite is disrupted. This is a model that has no satellite galaxies. Because as soon as you become a satellite, you're destroyed. Completely ridiculous, but you get a perfect fit. The other ridiculous model, alpha is infinity. Okay, satellite comes in, it's never disrupted. Two extremes, we could fit. TBCF means two point correlation function. That's a model where, in addition to constraining the data using the stellar mass functions, I also use the two point correlation functions from Sloan to constrain the model. Okay? So that model is much more constrained, and if I add those extra constraints, I can still perfectly fit the stellar mass function. I'll show you the fit of two point correlation function in a second. And finally, there's a model called CSMF, which means conditional stellar mass function. So now I tell him, you have to fit this stuff here plus the conditional stellar mass functions which we obtained from our galaxy group catalogs. Okay. I'll show you those data as well. So here are the other fits. 
So these are now these correlation functions that I use. So in the two PCF fit, I use these data as additional constraints on the model. You can see that that model, indeed, very nicely goes to the data point. So not only can I fit the abundances of galaxies, I also get to fit the clustering. Obviously now, the model that has no satellites after zero, the long dash line, completely screws up the clustering of small scales. Yeah, well, in a big, good coma cluster, I have one galaxy and no other galaxies, so I have no galaxy pair with small separation. So that's why I can't get that line. Obviously, off as zero is ruled out. Okay. Um, is this for different masses? This, oh, sorry, yeah, this is for different stellar masses. So this is a two-point correlation function for galaxies in this mass range, 10 to the 9 to the 10 to the 9. Um, fit one, where I never destroy a satellite, well, I start to overplay my clustering. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I build up basically a huge amount of satellites. I have many, many, many pairs with really small separations. My clustering goes up. And the good news is, if you ask what value of alpha do I get for this model, you get alpha very close to 1. Okay. It's basically the number of friction time. So that looks good. Okay. What about the conditional stellar mass function? So this now is a mass function, okay, stellar mass, the abundance of them, of galaxies that live in halos in this mass range. And this is halos in 10 to the 12, the shorter masses. This is from the Galaxy Group Catalog from Sloan. Again, perfect fit. Because the model where I never destroy satellites overplicks the number of satellites. The model where I completely destroy satellites, you don't see a line for the satellite because there are none. But the upshot is, you can fit all the data with a really simple model. And in multiple ways. And if you actually combine the data for a two-point correlation function and a conditional stellar mass function, both those two models actually agree with each other perfectly. It means that the model really makes sense. It's self consistent. So, take home message number three empirical models can easily fit all data with only a model set of three parameters. Now, in certain places, by now, I would have had very grumpy faces and people would say, yeah, 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 there's no physics anymore. <laughs> Who cares? Right? Well, to those critics, the fact that there's no physics in the model doesn't make it unphysical. Okay? <laughs> number one. Number two is, these empirical models, okay, at least they're not inhibited by restricted parameterizations of physical processes that are poorly understood. When we do a similar model and we claim, oh, we put in the physics of feedback, we're not doing the physics of feedback. We're using a parameterization of what we think feedback will do. Okay? And if that parameterization is wrong, you might be inhibited, but you might be too restricted. Okay. Other than simulations, Okay? They often turn off the hydro so that they actually get winds that blow out of the galaxy. That's not physics. That's unphysical. Okay? Empirical models are not the end goal. We're not going to stop here. Okay? This is the first step of a two-step process in which we're going to do reverse engineering. We're first going to figure out what does the answer have to look like, and now we can ask and say, okay, what do I have to modify in my physics so that I may get to this answer? Okay? So basically what we're doing is we're translating data, opaque data. Right? What, what does a two-point correlation function mean? If you do large-scale structure and you're interested in the slope of the power spectrum, yeah, the two-point correlation function makes some intuitive sense. If you're interested in galaxy information, what does a two-point correlation function mean? But if I translate that into a relation between the stellar mass of a galaxy and the mass of the halo in which it lives, that's language that we galaxy information people can do something. So empirical model is basically useful for informing galaxy information theory. Okay? And that's basically the way you should think about it. It doesn't want to describe the physics, it wants to inform the physics. Alright, so what insights can we gain regarding this physics of galaxy information now that we have a model that works? I think a very nice spot is sort of here. So we did this in, in, in January 2013. Uh, but the, the, the nice applause was from a similar paper by Peter Baruzzi. Basically, we both agree if you, if you make exactly the same plot. But basically, look at this plot. What he's plotting is a halo mass assumption of the time since the Big Bang. So here's the day, that's just zero, this goes back in time. And the color coding is according to the specific star formation efficiency. It basically means the star formation rate of a galaxy in that halo divided by the baryonic mass accretion rate of that galaxy. Okay. You work out how many masses it create as unit time, a certain fraction of that is baryons. Okay. So that's a baryonic mass equation rate. Okay. You think the star formation rate divided by that. That's the efficiency by which it turns new baryons into stars. 
And you see that that basically looks amazingly simple. Okay? Basically, all the star formation occurs in a very narrow band of halo mass from between 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 solar masses. And there's almost no evolution in that band from redshift zero all the way to as far as we can measure it. If you look at this plot, I mean, whatever you, it screams out to you, galaxy formation is simple, it's not complex, you idiots haven't just figured it out. Okay. Here's another interesting plot that I think gives some nice insight. So, so one thing with the model, okay, and, and, and we didn't explain in, in enough detail how we constrained this, but basically we had this idea that you had satellites that you could destroy and add them to the centrals or not. Basically what we have in the end, from all this fitting, we have a constraint in what we call the in situ fraction. The in situ fraction is, you go to a galaxy at a given redshift and you ask, what fraction of the stars that you have in that galaxy formed in situ by star formation in that galaxy versus were brought into that galaxy by accreting other galaxies. Okay? And that is plotted here now as a function of stellar mass and redshift. And in a color coding, goes from blue, which is one. That means, means in situ fraction of one, that means you never created anything. All your stars form in situ in the star formation. And that thing is blue everywhere. The only point where it's not blue is up here. The most massive galaxies grew by merging since the origin of one. But other than that, merging is irrelevant. What we think about is hierarchical universe and everything merging. Yeah, the dark matter halos merge, but not the galaxies. Okay? That's because of various reasons, and then because you basically destroy galaxies. You disrupt them, and they become intercostalized. And that's sort of shown here. This is a real image. This is from Pierre Duke, going really, really deep to about, I think, 29 magnitude to arc second square. I, mean, I, I thought this was a simulation. I mean, it's, it's amazing. All this stuff, if you look at the SES image, you just see a beautiful looking normal elliptical. You go much, much, much deeper, and you see all this stuff. This, what is that? That's all these disrupted satellites. They didn't merge into the central, they got disrupted and became intercostalized. We see it in the local group, right? In our own Milky Way halo, we see all these streams. It's the field of streams. We see all these streams. Okay? So, so we see that satellites are disrupted all around us. We have indirect evidence. You guys heard about Anna Pasquale, which is one over here. So this is a metallicity, stellar metallicity. Okay? This is from Sloan galaxies. You measure, how my galaxy did this, you measure for each galaxy the stellar metallicity. And we're plotting the stellar metallicity as a function of the mass of the halo in which the galaxy lives. And that we get from the group catalog. And the gray band is for central galaxies. So basically, you sort of see the central galaxies with even more massive halos, which are the more massive centrals, have a higher metallicity. So that's sort of, you know, no surprise there. And then the other colored things are satellite galaxies. So they're color coded according to the stellar mass of the satellite. And I look at this purple line. The purple line basically says the metallicity of the stars in a galaxy, and the satellite galaxy with about three times under nine solar masses, five times under nine solar masses apparently goes up with the mass of the host halo which it's orbiting. You start thinking about that, why, why the hell would the metallicity of the stars know about the halo which a guy is orbiting around? If you think hard enough, the only sort of meaningful answer you can come up with is because this guy had that stellar mass when it fell in. Metallicity is a good indicator of what was the maximum potential, what was the maximum stellar mass I ever reached. Then you fell in and you basically lost half of your stellar mass and now, basically, you have a metallicity that's too high for your current stellar mass. Okay. So you can interpret this as an indirect indication that mass stripping is very, very important. Okay. Much more important than is realized and, and treated in some of the models. So take home message number four. So this is a list of three conclusions of inferences about the physics of galaxy formation that we can make. Virtually all star formation occurs in halos in a very narrow band okay, of halo mass. I'm going to revise it in a minute. Merging is irrelevant, except for the most massive galaxies, and satellite disruption is utterly important. So now, quickly, the last method, the <coughs> forward approach. It's an even simpler than the previous model. We take a merger tree, and we make an assumption for the star formation rate as a function of halo mass and redshift. As simple as possible. Okay? We assume that satellites merge with the central after a time dynamical friction time, and then at that merger, a fraction F ICL of the satellite stars go to the stellar halo, and one minus F, that goes into the central galaxy. Okay? We 
construct the set of magic trees, propagate the model through the magic trees, compare the model to data, run it through a Bayesian inference engine, okay, we use multi-nest, change model parameters, okay, completely probe the posterior distribution, and then we use Bayesian evidence ratios to judge whether complexity of the model is too much or not. Here is the model. Let's assume, based on what we've learned, that there seems to be a band where star formation occurred. The star formation is heavily suppressed in halos below a mass M1, and heavily suppressed in halos above a mass M2, and then it peaks sort of in between. And for sake of anything more smart, I just use a three-piece three piece wise power law with three slopes. So I have alpha, beta, gamma, M1, M2, and a normalization, and I have this F, so there's seven free parameters, and that's my entire model. Okay, assume that none of these things evolve the direction. Okay. I run it through my pipeline now. Can I fit the mass, total mass function of the redshift zero? Here's the fit, data in black. The yellow line is the 68%, 95% confidence region from the posterior. Yeah, that's a perfect fit. Now I make posterior predictions for the mass function of higher action. Oops, doesn't work. Well, let's include now this data in the fitting and see if we didn't get a good fit. Answer is no. This model cannot fit all these data. It can fit the mass function ratio zero, but not function ratio. No problem. I'm going to just add one more piece of complexity. I'm going to make this gamma now function redshift. I add one free parameter, do the same exercise. Can I fit all the data? Yep. There we go. Good fit in data. Okay. And even break up the centrals and sublines. You see centrals are always dominant, it's sort of consistent with what we know. This is a good model. Okay. Fits the data very nicely. This is the model in terms of that halo mass, redshift, and the star formation efficiency. And it comes out the same thing. This band from 10 to 11, 10 to 12. That's where stars form, nowhere else. Okay, so once again, two different methods, same answer. Okay? Yeah, and, sorry? No, but uh, I, I could have found that I needed to change uh, all these things as a function of redshift, or I didn't find that. I found that I only needed a little bit of tuning here. Because the data doesn't need it. I want to start with the simplest model and only add more complexity than the data wants it. So what is C? C is a free parameter that I introduced because I couldn't get a fit. Oh, I've done none the value. It's not very high. So it's a very small, very small change. It's positive, yes. I have not larger than one, I don't know. It's positive. Maybe a different set of N1 and N2 is also. There's no need to try that because this fits. Well, <laughs> it depends, depends on what I agree with you. It depends on the question you want to ask. The model is I want to know how you need it. Very good. Okay. We'll come to that. And, and it gets less and less unique and, and more problematic if I add more data. That's what we're going next. But the main option is at this point, you should ask yourself why is it that semi analytical models with 32 free parameters cannot represent something as simple looking as this? Right? That, that I think is really what a question, we really should try to answer that. So empirical models can easily fit all the available data, I've said it before. So are the Sam's and Sims missing some relevant physics? Now, one idea is to add more data to that stupid model where M1 and M2 are fixed, and, right? So, well, they weren't fixed, right? They were free parameters, but they were fixed as a function of redshift. I didn't a priori constrain them, they were free parameters, but I didn't make them function of redshift. So that was regular right now I ask the question, does this model too that fits the stellar mass functions as a function of redshift reproduce some other data? Now let's throw a cluster luminosity function at it. So this is data from Professor, okay, cluster luminosity function, which show in the leaf vein end this really dramatic upturn. What does our model have to say about it? Nope. Well, that's a posterior prediction. Maybe if we include the data in the model fit, we can fit it. Nope. We can't. So we need more freedom in the model. So let's wiggle around, and we wiggle quite a bit. It wasn't trivial. What we need to do is now change this alpha function of redshift. And again, I haven't explored whether there are other solutions. Okay, we're just scratching the surface with this thing. But one method that worked was making alpha function of redshift, but in sort of a stepwise way. We had to sort of keep it constant at low redshift, and then at above a given critical redshift, it had to become redshift dependent. So here is, with such a model, I can get the fit. Okay? It still fits. The stellar mass function is a function of redshift. These blue points are just new data that, that came out after we, we published it. You see it's not consistent with black points. And, you know, 
data is always a problem, but yeah, it's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> They're just asking, can we make it consistent with data, and can we take one data? Um, so basically, the same model that if we were added an extra fix still fits the previous data. It also fits, these are posterior predictions again, this was not used in fitting, it fits the conditional stellar mass functions reasonably well. And, and, okay, there's some hint for discrepancy, but nothing to really worry about. And here's what that model looks like. So this is model two, which has that band, and here's model three. And what we had to do basically was add this enhanced star formation efficiency in low mass halos. Now, this is a confusing problem because this is a redshift, which is stupid. We should have called time, which basically means this is very low time, right? Redshift 2 is out of this at 10 years old. So, so most of it is time, the universe is just doing what it does in, in the simple model. But at very high redshift and high redshift above 2, I apparently need to boost the star formation efficiency in low mass halos. Okay? Now, are you serious, really? Well, can we test what are the predictions that model 2 and 3 make that differ from each other that we can use to test? But it's really is true. Well, what is shown here is that above the stellar mass functions, okay, a function of redshift. So, so the black dots are the date of redshift zero, the blue line is the prediction of the model of redshift zero, and then the other curves are at higher and higher redshift, all the way up to redshift 10. Okay? So that's what the model predicts the stellar mass function should look like. Here's model three. Again, yeah, the redshift zero fits the data, but then you look at these things and they're very different. Okay? You look at the low mass end, the slopes of those curves are completely different. They're much steeper in model 3. So with JWST, we're going to be able to tell the difference between these two models. Okay? But you don't have to wait until JWST. We can actually use stellar archaeology to test this. What I'm plotting here is a cumulative star formation history function of loop back time. Okay? So cumulative star formation means you look at all the stars in the galaxy today and ask at what redshift did those stars form. And the color coding is going to the stellar mass of the galaxy. Red here, a massive, massive galaxy, 10 to 12 solar masses, which according to model 2 had to make all the stars really, really early and then didn't do anything. Whereas a galaxy of 10 to the 6 and the 7 solar masses just formed the stars over the entire range of the universe. This is what we call downsizing, right? Some people call downsizing. It's one of the 612 definitions of downsizing. Okay? <laughs> And it's monotonic, it's well behaved. This is sort of what similar to models can define over time. This is model three, it's wacko. Okay? Suddenly, at a certain mass scale, it flips over. And it starts to predict that as we have a break in this monotonicity, that if you go to low enough stellar mass systems, you suddenly see that they basically have, look more like old systems. They form a large fraction of the stars very early on. It's just a prediction. You can imagine how happy we were when we saw this paper come out. Okay? This was Sam Lightman's paper. And basically, he used data from Weizago, which is on the paper. Um, so basically, this is the same plot. Cumulative star formation instruments, function of loopback time. This is the, the colors of data from Sloan, where people use the Sloan spectra and then do some modeling to figure out what is the star formation history of all those galaxies. And it basically looks the same as what you see here, the sort of monotonic behavior, more massive galaxies formed earlier. But then suddenly, you go from 8.3 to 7.6, and you jump from here to poof flips over. And these really low mass isolated dwarf galaxies, they're not satellites, these are isolated dwarf galaxies, have star formation history that formed 50% of their stars or more at high redshift. A very nice agreement with this model. So maybe there is some truth to it. So is that an analysis of static spectra? Uh, yes. As far as I recall, right? The best was so. No, I don't think so. I think best does it for each individual halo and then they stack the results. I, 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 any experts? How does this depend on environment? They haven't explored that. It's also like the, that makes it look like it's a flip, but they're very, very different techniques. They're totally different sets of files. So, th so yeah. it's yes. a little enthusiastic. But, but that this is a prediction for the model now, and right? let's go after it and check it. Do the same thing. No, I completely agree. Okay. But, but here's another one. I understand your happiness. Yeah. <laughs> it's more happiness, more happiness, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So this is from a recent paper by Smith et al. What it is, they used the UV luminosity functions from Sloan and turned it into a star formation rate function. Now, anyone who works on that knows the uncertainties, but ignore that. Okay, because the model. So, so this is the black dots of the data. This is the star formation rate function. It's just like a stellar mass function, 
But now instead of star, instead of actually star formation rate, you hope the abundance of galaxies as a function of the star formation rate. This is the data I've written before, and the red, the, the red line is a model prediction for the same thing. Okay, model two, way under predict the number of low star forming galaxies. Is model three, let's see those bang through data. The other two curves are just a wretched zero and two, where models two and three basically look very similar. Okay. So there are some more than just the upturn and the cluster luminosity function. There's a bunch of hints that suggest that maybe we need that new characteristic scale, something needs to happen into the star formation efficiency of low mass halos around the range of the two. And that's just another indication that this kind of empirical modeling is very useful for inference, okay, learning about galaxy formation. So the data suggests a dramatic change, that may be a new characteristic scale in galaxy formation, okay, and let me put up the conclusions. I hope I'm convinced that due to great advances, and this mainly is advances in data, right? If it wasn't for Sloan and 2D air and all these redshift surveys, we wouldn't have been able to do this. But we really now have an accurate statistical description of the galaxy dark matter connection. Empirical modeling based on these halo formation models is able to accurately fit all the existing data. Okay? At least it proves that there's nothing conceptually wrong with the Lambda CDM paradigm. You can get a fit, okay? You haven't yet figured out what the physics is that do it, does it? Okay. These models do seem to suggest an extremely simple form for the star formation rate assumption of halo mass and redshift, which surprisingly the semi-analytical models apparently can't reproduce, although semi-analytical models, no one has actually fully explored that 35-dimensional parameter space. Okay? So maybe the model is in there, but they haven't gotten it yet, because they never do Bayesian analysis. Well, they're starting to do that, but it's really hard, right? The 35 3 parameters and, and these models take a long time, so it's computationally challenging. Data on dwarf galaxies suggest a new characteristic epoch in galaxy formation, something to do with the star formation efficiency in redshift of 2. The open question, of course, is well, what can cause this? And for Tomer here, well, maybe preheating where TEV blazers okay, just happened at the right, right time, and it basically moves the mass scale up right by right, the right number. So I'm happy to explore that any further. Thank you. Thank you very much for this exciting talk. Um, I would like to start with students. Sorry for that. Question from students first. At least two or so. <laughs> but if, if nobody is asking a question, fine. Now, yeah, students or nobody at all? I do have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the first question right here. Okay, it's still open to students. So, please. Yeah. I was wondering if you could use other closure ratios, right? So, you've got the cell and mass evolving, and that makes predictions for the star formation rates. And also, you have to have fuel for the star formation, so it assumes something, you know, that implies something about what's happening to the gas atoms. Have you compared that set? No, nope. that's, that's the next set. We're working on that to include the gas. Um, I think it's going to be less, there's much more freedom suddenly, um, so I'm not entirely convinced that, you run the risk that basically, before you know it, turning it into a settlement model again, right? And um, if you sort of allow yourself all the sort of freedom you can think of, and, and, and you want to go for simplicity and, and, and transparency, but I do agree that ultimately it makes no sense. Well, the reason why I think it's an option is we know that most of that gas that goes into the stars is only always a small fraction of the total gas. So, so we're going to put constraints on how much gas does it come in, but we know that that gas that we're talking about is always going to be a few percent, and the, the, the rest of the gas is swashing around and can do all sorts of things. So, so that, but, 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 but we, we started we started playing with it, and I totally agree with you that. That's not true. At the high star formation, high redshift. Most Correct. of the gas is being stars. Correct. Yeah. Next question was here. Do you want to ask no? Now we can move on to Andrea, I think. Yeah. <coughs> I don't want to defend some medical models, but it's true that when your model is not fitting something, for example, it's a function of redshift, you say, okay, let's make this parameter varying as a function of redshift, which kind of is the solution if you know it's going to work. 
And similarly, the model, since they tend to capture the physics somehow, they don't have this freedom. So how fair is the comparison at the end of the day? Well, again, it's not really intended to bash some of the models. It's more like, I had this impression. <laughs> good. I have to keep you away from this hot day. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's, this is an inference engine, right? It's not, it's not prescribing a physics. It's an inference engine. We're trying to see, we try to learn what do the analytical models maybe need to do to make it work. And, and maybe the answer is, oh, they need to make their supernova efficiency skill a little better. But trust me, I mean, they are not very uh, restricted by imagination, those people. And they have come up with all sorts of weird scaling relations about, oh, I'm going to park the gas that comes out of the wind into a reservoir, and then there's a cork that sits in the reservoir and says, oh, after a time that depends on halo miles on redshift, it's going to go and rain back. They play the same kind of things, and they, they have nothing against making things dependent on redshift. Okay? Maybe they haven't tried it, and maybe this gives them a hint in what direction to try it. Uh, that's not really yeah, and, um, so, in the forward model of the section, you have a star formation efficiency as a function of halo mass, which is relatively simple. We can do that with that sort of saying that low mass. So, since that fits some of the data that the semi analytic models don't, it implies that the semi analytic models have some different star formation history, you know, efficiency as a function of redshift. And it would be interesting to see what that actually. So I can tell you what it looks so like. So I can tell you what it looks like. And I think that you the Russian crap that already gives you a very good hint. The problem is that star formation history in the semi-local models very closely traces the mass accretion history without matter halo. Now we have learned from halo formation modeling that they don't trace each other at all. So if the halo mass doubles, the galaxy does not double. And basically that, that's because of that band of 10 to the 11. Right? Yeah. Apparently, for most of the time, halos grow to the just don't form stars. So the halo mass is growing there, but, but star formation is not catching up. Suddenly, it hits 10 to the 11, it starts to form a star. Okay. That's the problem. The semi-local models keep, during the entire time, from basically the, the, the reionization scale, which is 10 to the 9 is solar mass at high range, up to 10 to the 11, they're just forming star. And the problem is, they can't do that with supernova feedback. They can't decouple it with supernova feedback. And there have been several papers that have shown that there is this sort of uh, tracking behavior something called the bathtub model, and it goes with all sorts of names. But basically, you can turn up your feedback, but if you want more feedback, you need more star formation. So, so you know, it, the problem is to try to kill star formation with star formation. That's a problem. And because of that, they can't really do it. They're, they're sort of stuck in the loop, and they, they can turn it up and down, and it doesn't do anything. It moves galaxies along a relation, but they can't get it off the relation. And I think that's where the problem sits. And that would suggest that you need to do something with the supernova feedback description. And some people are playing with this idea of, like, well, you can break it if you can sort of put some freedom in how long the gas stays out there. So you kick it out, and now it lingers out there, and you give it a lot of freedom and when it comes back. Then you can break that. And that's what people are exploring at the moment. Next is, uh, I have a, a problem. Uh, who has the panel uh, to turn off? Turn on the light. It's here. Could you please turn off that quasar? <laughs> <laughs> turn off the quasar. And turn ah, that's much better for discussion. And turn off, turn off the quasar. <laughs> okay, Thomas. So first of all, it's nice to see that uh, finally the galaxy uh, population of people does understand star formation, and I just want to make sure that it's not just feedback. Now, there is this assumption that stars immediately form from clouds if you put gas. I think we have learned that salt formation is intrinsically inefficient process, which has nothing to do with feedback, actually. But right? it's bringing together a material which is massive enough to form stars. But my question is, about your second part of the talk, they have two parameters, one parameter, actually, but you also talked about the second one. And you have models, so they change the parameters, but you got an equally good fit to your data. Isn't that uh, a bit of a problem for your models because they're practically not constrained? I'm not sure. This was your alpha parameter or... So I added freedom here, but, but I included this no, as data, right? No, it's slight, actually. It's a slight where you have to start. I think we'll slide back. Like when you're showing your score, I don't know. So 
here I had everything was fixed with redshift. I could only fit the redshift 0, 1. And I added freedom and I could fit all stellar masses, mass function, all redshift. But that model failed at fitting this cross luminosity function. I add an extra data set, it right. no longer fits. Now I add new parameters and I can fit everything. Sure, I understood that, but then you also showed that then at some point you also have to change the model. And then the question I would have is how unique is your whole process? Because all they said, well, I constrain now my model, then I add something to the model. But uh, I'm pretty sure that you could also design another model which would then fit your data. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. If, if so, so that's so guiding so the physics. I would be very, you know, I would be reluctant to buy that. I, you're completely right. I agree. But, but again, I'm trying to, to advertise that this method has the potential. I think we already see hints of where we're learning things. Um, but you're right. The next step is, you know, you, you try to do this in a non parameter way or, or, or make sure that you, you explore all possible degeneracies. At least in this approach, okay, we check every time. We use base factors to check that at least, you know, the extra complexity that we add is warranted by the data. But you're right. Degeneracies and other options and other parameterizations might work equally well with a few of So again, that's I think where this method is really useful, right? Because when you compare these models two and three, and I showed you some examples, and I think you know ultimately, it, it, I think a lot of this lingers around the, the what happens on the dwarf galaxy scale. I think we have lots of problems with dwarf galaxies, the galaxy formation, the dynamic groups, all sorts of things. So getting better data on that, and, and what kind of data? Uh, um, I think I think a big problem is that most of us, when we think about dwarf galaxies, we think about these things moving around in our local group. They are satellites. They have been disrupted. They have been you know, experienced a random pressure shift. They are exposed to all sorts of processes that complicate things. I want data on isolated dwarf galaxies. Problem is, the pain can't see them very far out. Um, but that, that would really help to constrain the model. So, if you look at the star formation history of the little cool stars, you can see that none of them formed stars later than 10 years ago. So, that, that's, that's not true. true. Sculptor, Karina. So I mean, not, not super close, not, you know, not so the, the that, that, wait, the, the first first star formation earlier, basically, in the same year. That's what they did. Or the oh, oh, that they started yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so basically, once they are basically a form of the condensed and started forming stars, yes, then. Wait, Leo A actually didn't really get, I mean, it maybe formed a few stars earlier on. But, oh, yes, but Leo A actually, actually yeah. most of it started. And we don't have any environments to do so for things. I mean, we only talk about this. Peter's boy phenomenon is sort of such an environment thing, right? I mean, he basically says uh, the little uh, dwarf, the voice and the, the dwarfs and the boys, basically, they see that they apparently are sort of dimmer than the average um, star formation, luminosity function. So, I mean, if you believe that this is a problem, I mean, that would again argue that, that you need something that depends on the one that makes the data. Yeah, I mean, so, so one, one thing, the way to think about it, right, is, is this sort of is this mass above which you can only form stars, okay? yeah. which apparently the data seems to say is roughly 10 to the 11. You do a realization, it should look around something like this, right? Here's before realization, the universe reionizes, and then basically from the 2 times 24 Kelvin. Okay? And now you can sort of draw trajectories through that, right? You know, you can make one that is like this, sits here, forms stars at very, very time, then becomes a satellite yard. That has only old stars, okay, from the ultra faint. So there's something like this, crosses through, makes an old population, sits still, makes a second population, here are these two populations, right? This is real data, right? And then we can set like Now, this thing we're suggesting, this scale, basically would move basically this mass, because there's another step function here happening at redshift 2. That could be your PV heating, right? That would move another bit. And you can go 
constrain that by looking at your satellite population and asking, okay, how many of them have multiple populations and when did the multiple populations happen? All that is going to put constraint on what this functional form of this thing looks like. And that's what we're doing at the moment. The point is, the Solonius and Brexit stuff, if it's at mean density, right? If it's sort of above so, your so density, yeah, you, you have 10, you're going to achieve them. Correct. And it's not going to have any effect here. So if this is, in fact, the future for this, then you really have to sort of collapse late. Oh yeah, uh, how sensitive are your results to your conclusions to the adopted Helms function? Oh, probably not sensitive at all. Well, I mean, if I, if I change, so basically, if I change my cosmology, this is all done for dummy math. No, but I, I mean, uh, the spherical lower density mass function is different from the friends of friends, down to the high precision and, and body simulations. There is an, an archive. Oh, but, but, but my mass function is not sensitive to the definition of Helms. I use for a shaker. No, I mean, if I change my mass function, the absolute values will be somewhat different. If I change my cosmology, okay, I have a different mass function, the actual galaxy formation physically, if you end up with the same galaxy formation, it's going to be slightly different. But I think, within the uncertainties of my halo mass function, within the uncertainties we have these days in cosmology, cosmology well, I think my head is very sensitive, more struggle. I mean, we haven't explored that. It will be known the same thing, but ultimately, you know, there's an awful generacy for a given cosmology within the galaxy formation physics. Now open the box of cosmology, and, but it's, it's not definitely something that's interesting to explore. No more questions. Doesn't seem to be the case. Then let's take our.